Good morning. Good to see you. Good to be back in church. Lovely day. A little chilly. Let's open in prayer. Father, we are thankful to be here. Well, we thank you for a good warm place to gather this morning. And God, just pray that you would meet with us in a special way. Just touch our hearts. God, be with each one that takes part in service, we pray. Our brother that comes to preach. Lord, bless us in song as we lift praise to you. And, and God, just prepare our hearts for the message that we're to hear. Be, be with those, Father, that are unable to be here today, we pray. Lead us and guide us in all that we do. For it's in Christ's name. Amen. If you have a bulletin, we'd invite you to take a look at it. I have a few announcements I want to share with you. In your bulletin, you'll see this evening we meet at 5.30. We'd always invite you to come back out and uh, take part in our evening service. This coming week, Wednesday night, church business meeting and Bible study time at 7. There's an announcement there concerning youth meetings. If that pertains to you, they'll now be held here at the church at 7 p.m. on the 1st, 2nd, and some third Wednesday nights. How do you like that? You'll, you'll be made aware of when, when they're going to meet on those nights as well. Some, some Wednesday nights we have some additional things going on. So uh, if you're involved in the youth program, you'll, you'll be made aware of that. Uh, we have not, we decided to not begin Sunday school back at this time. So we will, we will do that just as soon as we think it's safe. And uh, we will also make you aware of that. Those of you that picked up Sunday school books, continue to read. Continue to study. It's a great study that's uh, in our Sunday school right now. Would ask you to be a part of that. Um, let's see. I have a prayer request that was given to me. Would uh, read that to you at this time. It says uh, uh, this prayer request is from Melissa Welch. Her grandfather, John Harville, uh, has many medical conditions and is battling currently pneumonia, sepsis. And many strokes, not doing very well at all. Please pray for him and his wife, Joan Harville, and all their family. Another announcement, uh, any of the ladies that have not gotten contact with April um, concerning or that would be interested in the women's Bible study, please uh, sign up on the way out today and uh, trying to get their literature and everything together for that Bible study. I um, also want to share with you some final numbers. We're, we're pleased to be able to announce our Lottie Moon offering. We, we have brought it to an end, but we met and exceeded our goal. Uh, we did have a church goal of $5,000, and with all the, all the help from everyone, we've reached $5,640.40. So we're, yeah, that's right. That's exciting. We know how that money is used, and uh, just, a, just a great thing to be a part of that ministry. Um, a couple other things. Let's do this. I'll just come to you guys. All right, let's see what else I got here in my goodies. How many knows what this is? Well, I know there's seven of us that really know what this is. We, we were fortunate to get to go back to Charlotte yesterday and participate in some additional packing of the shoe boxes. But I want to tell you about this, this box, a little different than the boxes that we packed here at church. And so we learned, we learned a little bit yesterday and want to share that with you because it's, uh, it's an important part of that Samaritan's Purse ministry that uh, I don't think most of us are aware of. Um, 
nine million, over nine million shoe boxes this year that Samaritan's Purse sent out all over the world. And we were, we were fortunate to be a part of that and in a lot of ways. And uh, those boxes went out to countries and areas that were relatively safe and easy for them to get the distribution taken care of. Nine million. That's a lot of little boys and girls that uh, were blessed. And those boxes, of course, not only carry gifts, but the gospel. And so it's so important that uh, that, that, that is done. But I'm going to tell you what makes this box different. And I know you're not up here and you can't really take a close look at it. But the thing that's unique about this and that we really didn't know, I don't think, going down what we were going to be participating in, we knew we were going to pack boxes and put boxes together. These boxes don't have any markings on them at all that say Samaritan's Purse, no tape, no stickers, nothing. This says boy or girl, you got an age group. What we were fortunate to get in on yesterday, over the next few weeks, they're going to complete an additional 300,000 of these boxes. And these boxes are going to go out in places in the world that are difficult to get to. And that it would be challenging if it had a, a name like Samaritan's Purse on the box. So they're, they're shipped anonymously in that, in that situation. But they're going to go to some places that are just would otherwise not be possible to reach. So we were able to be a part of that. The facility we were at there yesterday approximately packed about 50,000 boxes yesterday. And uh, that'll be a part of that 300,000 total that'll be going out. And again, the way you participate in this would be you can go online and you can select from a list of items that are on there that will be, uh, the boxes will be built, built up by folks like ourselves that were able to go and assembled. And when you go online, you get a pick what you would like to have placed in those boxes from their list and um, then you get to pay for and, and uh, pay for the shipping and, and you know there's some expense involved but you're you're involved in this ministry in a different way so just wanted to share that with you to let you know you know there's there's a there's a side of the Samaritan's Purse shoebox ministry that we probably never heard of and, and had never participated in but it was a real blessing yesterday to get to go and uh and actually help assemble and, and hear that story and be a part of that. All right. Are there other announcements that need to be made this morning? Anyone? All right. We'll continue with our service. We're going to start with page 141. The Old Rugged Cross. We're going to sing first, second, and last, and it will be on the screen. Page 141.
then page 522, When the Morning Comes, and we'll sing all three, page 522. Trials dark on every hand and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to the blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome. We will Cherished plans have failed, disappointments have prevailed, and we've wandered in the darkness, heavy hearted and alone. But we're trusting in the Lord, and according to His word, we will. The last one we're going to sing this morning is Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. So you will need the screen for this one. So if you'll stand as we sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
Good morning. morning. It's good to be back with you again this morning. You could have provided better weather. Aren't you glad you're going to heaven? You realize that the temperature there is probably around 72 degrees day and night. I don't know that for a fact. I can't prove it biblically, but if it is an atmosphere of perfection... I promise you it won't be going cold. And for all of you snowbirds, I would just remind you that snow is a product of sin. (laughs) And if you don't believe me driving construction traffic in Henderson and Buncombe County with snow on the roads and snow on the ground, and you'll see just how big of a product of sin snow is. But it is great to be here this morning on cold and snowy morning. I invite you to take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 32. We're going to begin reading in verse 24 through verse 32. 
And this morning I want to preach to you an uncharacteristic message on an unusual passage that creates several questions, some of them which we will pose and try to answer this morning. A passage of Scripture about an unusual moment. And I want to entitle this message, Unusual Methods for Spiritual Development. Genesis chapter 32, beginning in verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he, Jacob, said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. The first instance that that word is used in all of Scripture. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? Or to paraphrase, Why are you having to ask my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Penal. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, which is a different variation with the same meaning of the name Penal, the sun rose upon him, and he halted or limped upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, unto this day because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. Very many years ago, in an English town, a mother beamed with pride when she discovered that her son had been selected, a rock mason, to work upon a great cathedral that was being built in their hometown. Each day, the, daughter, the mother would describe to her friends how her son was being involved in the building of a building that would be erected purely for the glory of God, a center of worship for their community. She bragged to all of her friends, all of her family members, and anyone who would listen. Each day she would walk past the construction site trying to get a glimpse of her son up upon the scaffolding as he did his work. But there was a barrier built around the construction site to protect the pedestrians from fallen objects, and she had difficulty seeing her son at work. One day she devised a plan. She would create a meal and she would take it to those working upon that great cathedral and there she would gain entrance into and be allowed to see her son engaging upon her, his great activity of building a house of worship for the Lord. So she prepared a meal. She took it to the construction supervisor. She was allowed through the construction gate and she began to immediately look for her son. But he was not on the scaffolding. Instead, he was in the back corner of the construction site with a group of tools and one large rock and he was pounding on that rock with hammer and chisel. His mother went and asked the question, Son, why are you not working on the scaffolding? Why are you not being engaged in erecting the this building. And the son responded by saying, Mother, I am preparing a stone which will set upon the highest pinnacle of the cathedral. And she said, Well, why, son, are you doing it down here? Shouldn't you be doing it upon the scaffolding where you can be seen and it can be adjusted from there? He said, No, Mom, what you must understand is this. I must prepare the stone here so that it will be right when it's placed up there. Do you realize that at the moment of conversion, the Holy Spirit of God enters the life of the believer and instantaneously a process begins 
whereby we are being continually conformed unto the image of Christ. And through the Word of God, through conviction of sin, through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life, that which does not look like Jesus is continuously being chiseled away from us so that He might be manifest through us and so that the world here might get a glimpse of what it's like up there and so that when we, prepared here by the Holy Spirit of God, get to that place in the sky, we'll be prepared for our final residence. You know what I've discovered I have discovered that God will use any means and method necessary that is consistent with His holiness and not outside of His nature to bring His purpose of conforming us to the image of His Son to pass. And sometimes He will even use unusual methods in order to bring us to the point of full conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those methods are illustrated in this instance where Jacob tangles with an assailant while alone beside the Jabbok River. Do you realize that Jacob spent most of his life trying to live up to his name? The name Jacob means supplanter. It means to grasp by the heel. It means trickster. It carries with it the idea of deception. As a matter of fact, in the book of Jeremiah, when we're told that the heart is des desperately wicked or deceitful above all things, that word deceitful is actually a derivative of the name Jacob. Jacob was a trickster in our common modern day vernacular. We might refer to Jacob as a con man. You remember that Jacob was the second born child, a twin. His brother Esau was first from the womb. Traditionally, in the Jewish tradition, it was customary for the eldest child to receive the greatest portion of the inheritance and the blessing, an important factor in Jewish life. The blessing of the father would go to the first child. But Jacob was promised by God through his mother, that he would be the one chosen by God to be the patriarch of the nation of Israel and to be the human executor of the covenant given by God to Abraham and to his father Isaac. But Jacob took his matters or took God's will into his own hands. And through extortion, he cheated his brother out of his birthright. Out of deception... He tricked his father into giving him his blessing instead of Esau. And as a result, brother Esau vowed to kill Jacob. And it was at that moment in Jacob's testimony that mother Rebecca decided it might be time for Jacob to take a vacation and let his brother cool off. So he traveled to the land of his uncle Laban and there he discovered that what comes around goes around. He discovered that the deception that Jacob had practiced was part of his DNA because his uncle had the same characteristic within him. And they began a battle of deceiving one another for 20 years. And after that period of deception, Jacob decided that it was time when his uncle became suspicious of him and suspicious of his own deception, that Jacob decided it may be time to try going back home. So he leaves Uncle Laban's house, and he travels back toward the land of promise, the land of Canaan. And as he begins to get closer and closer home, a report comes that Esau, the brother who wanted to kill him, is approaching with 400 armed men. And Esau immediately taking matters into his own hands, as he always had, provides gifts to be sent to Esau to hopefully temper his temper. And then he divides his family and his flocks 
by wives and concubines in several dispersed areas in order that in case Esau, his brother, attacks a portion of the family and the fortune may be lost, but the rest may in some way possibly survive. And then the night before Esau's meeting of Jacob, Jacob slips off by himself to a little place called the Jabbok River. And in that moment, he meets an unexpected visitor. Jacob's unprepared to meet his brother. Jacob's unprepared to enter in once again to the land of promise. Jacob's unprepared to be the patriarch of the nation of Israel. Jacob's unprepared to be the human executor of the covenant that God has rendered to his family and to the fledgling nation. But in that instance, in that moment by the Jabbok River, God begins to chisel away everything of Jacob that needs to be chiseled away in order for Jacob to become what God needs him to become in order for him to fulfill the purpose for which God has called him to that moment in his life. And he uses some unusual methods. As a matter of fact, the first unusual method that he used on Jacob and he often uses on us is this. Wrestling with an unexpected opponent is often God's way of chiseling away in us that which doesn't look like him. Verse 32. Jacob is by the Jabbok River. And then we're told in verse 24, I'm sorry, In verse 24, that as Jacob is left alone, there he wrestles with a man. First of all, I've got to point out that the word wrestle is not a figure of speech, a metaphor, or a simile. It is not merely a word used to describe or illustrate something else other than the reality that Jacob was involved in hand-to-hand combat with an assailant that the Scripture calls a man. But we discover later that this was no mere man. Instead, this was an individual who carried with in his nature divinity. For we are reminded by Jacob, by the naming of the place as Peniel, God face to face. And we're also reminded that Jacob brings us the reality that this individual with whom he wrestles is possibly, has the possibility or the probability of blessing him. In reality, who Jacob wrestled with was the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. An Old Testament appearance of Jesus prior to his birth in Bethlehem. But he's not there to comfort Jacob. He's not there to soothe Jacob. He's involved in a wrestling match with Jacob. And the question immediately that must be posed is, why is Jesus wrestling with one of his children? Because sometimes God has to wrestle with us in order to make us what he needs and wants for us to be. In his book, When Heaven is Silent, Ron Dunn wrote this, Later in life, I discovered that my greatest wrestling matches, my greatest struggles and my greatest battles were not with the devil or the world. They were with God. If you want to see a picture of someone who wrestled with God, read Romans chapter 7. And you'll discover that Paul had his own battle with the Lord as the Lord was working in Paul's life as well. The book of Galatians, Paul writes that the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit lusteth against the flesh. Some modern translations have render it this way. The flesh warreth or the flesh wrestles against the spirit and the spirit wrestles against the flesh. It brings to mind the reality that you and I often fight against God and what he wants to do in our lives. And what he wants to do becomes more of a wrestling match 
than a moment of preparation. But why in this instance? Why is it necessary? Why is it necessary for you and I, for us to wrestle with God, or more importantly, for God to wrestle with us? Because sometimes that's the only way we learn what we need to let go of. Jacob finds himself wrestling with an assailant. He thought initially that it possibly or probably had to be Esau, but he realizes that he is wrestling with divinity. He's wrestling with God. And the reason for the wrestling match, what has encouraged it, what has imposed it, what has brought it about is there's some things that Jacob needs to let go of. Jacob needs to let go of his deception. <clears throat> Jacob needs to learn that he needs to trust God, not Jacob. Jacob needs to learn that God's will done man's way produces results that are not God's will. You know that you can do a right thing the wrong way and it's wrong. Sometimes we need to learn to let go of some things so that we can hold on to that which God wants us to hold on to. In order for us to be conformed to the image of Christ, there are some opinions, there are some traditions, there are some falsehoods, there are some sins, there are some activities, habits, and hobbies that must be let go of if we're going to become an Israel rather than remaining a Jacob. But there's a second reason that we must occasionally wrestle with God. Not only do we need to learn what to let go of, but we need to learn who to hold on to. Is it possible for Jacob to hold on to anything else when he's holding on to Almighty God? Jacob's in a wrestling match with God. Do you really think that he can let go? I've got to interject something at this point in this sermon that Manly Beasley said about this text years ago. You do realize this is a fixed fight. Do you think for an instance or for a moment that Jacob could survive or last in a wrestling match against divinity. Well, if you don't think Jacob could, why do you wrestle with God? In reality, why do we wrestle with God or think we can when we know Jacob couldn't? God requires us to wrestle with him at times so that we will realize who we need to hold on to. Jacob had to hold on. There seems to be the implication within this text that both Jacob and his assailant were wrestling and grappling at, with great determination and great perseverance. And there seems to be an argument as to who's going to let go first. But Jesus is going to require Jacob to hold on until the blessing is received. There is a phrase that our forefathers used to say frequently. And then we have lost it in our modern Christian vernacular and vocabulary. And it is this. There are moments when the believer must have what's referred to as hanging on faith. Hanging on faith was used by our ancestors to describe moments when adversity was so great, when travail was so difficult that the only thing you could do was hold on to Jesus until Jesus came through. And that's what God's trying to teach Jacob. And that's what he wants to teach you and I. He wrestles with us in order so that we will know what we must let go of, but he also wrestles with us so that we'll know what we need to hold on to. And that is him. But there's a third reason that he wrestles with us. Not merely so that we'll know what to let go of, who to hold on to, but so that we'll realize who's been holding on to us all along. This instance at the Jabbok River is not the first time that Jacob has had an introduction to who God is. 20 years earlier at Bethel, a ladder was seen by, a vision of a ladder was seen by Jacob and God standing at the top of the ladder and demonstrating that he was active in and among the creation that he had created. He showed Jacob the way to the Father and he showed Jacob who was in control of heaven and earth by who was residing over the ladder in the activity. And then in this instance when Jacob thinks he's wrestling with Esau. He discovers that it's someone more powerful, that is someone more determined. 
And then he asks that question later on in verse 29. What is your name? He asks his assailant, what is your name? Jesus responds not with an answer to the question, but with another question. Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? Carries with it the idea that Jesus responded to Jacob by saying, Why do you have to ask my name? You met me at Bethel. You've heard about me from Grandpa Isaac, or from Grandpa Abraham, and from Father Isaac. I've been with you all along. We fail to recognize his presence until he just has to grab on to us. I would love to have the intellectual capability and the vocabulary to describe to you the necessity, the purpose, the principles, the precepts, and the probability of why we must need occasionally to wrestle with God or God wrestle with us. But I don't. But I will use a compound illustration in order to try. A compound illustration is describing two things or illustrating two things that seem to be incomparable to show their comparison in order to amplify another truth. The first portion of my illustration is this, in the Sermon on the Mount. In the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, in what's referred to as the Beatitudes, Jesus makes a statement that describes the characteristics of those who will inhabit the kingdom, and he says, the meek shall inherit the earth. And that, word, that Greek word meek does not mean weak. It does not mean frail. It does not mean one who is of little strength. Instead, that word actually means this, power surrendered to the control of another. It was actually used as a term to describe a wild animal that had been domesticated. As soon as I hear the definition of that word, what comes to my mind, and I know it may not be spiritual, but it helps me, is the old western movies that I used to watch when I was a little boy. You remember those westerns? When one of those cowboys, a real cowboy, I'm not talking about these new age, new fangled cowboys who wear their jeans too tight (laughs) and don't know what it's really like in the Wild West. I'm talking about John Wayne. When John needed a horse, he didn't go to a sale and he didn't go to the livery stable and buy one. What did those cowboys like John Wayne do? They went out onto the plain and they found a herd of mustangs. When they found that herd of Mustangs, they discovered which Mustang was the wildest and rankest and meanest and strongest Mustang in the bunch. And it was that stallion that they selected as their own. He roped him and he brought him into his corral. And when when that Mustang arrived at the cowboy's corral, that cowboy would begin to stroke that horse and speak softly and gently to that horse in order that that horse may come to an understanding of the desire of the cowboy to be his friend and to be his and to involve himself in his life. He was earning the trust of the horse through the softness of his voice and through the tenderness of his care. And then there would come that moment when a bridle would be placed upon that wild stallion and a lead would be placed to the bridle and that cowboy would begin to lead that horse slowly around the corral several times of day. He was using that instance in order to train that horse to follow the commands of its owner. There was always that moment. There was always that moment if that stallion was going to be domesticated and used by the cowboy for the usage for which it was called and wrangled. The saddle had to go on the horse's back. And there was a war of wheels that occurred. And the cowboy always won. How does that amplify what we're discussing? Let me tell you what happened when Jesus saved Greg. He went out into the wildest, rankest portion of this world 
And he found the most obstinate, wretched, wretched sinner he could find. And by his grace, through his love, he lassoed me and brought me into his corral. He began to speak softly to me so I would know his voice and I would begin to trust him. He would soothe me in moments of agony and pain. And then he began to slowly lead me around so that I would know how to follow his voice and so I would trust in his care and his movements. But then there was that moment when I had to discover who was going to be Lord and who was going to be God. And the saddle had to be put, placed on the back and the wrestling match began. But thank God, he will not quit until I need, till I know who I need to hold on to. Now I know, I know, I know, there may be an animal activist among us. There may be a PETA member within our ranks that would say horse was a whole lot better off when it was in the wild. My response would be this. Did you ever interview the horse? Just think about it. When that horse was wild and it was on the plain and it was not a possession of the cowboy, when droughts came, when dangers arrived, when there was snow upon the ground and there was nothing to eat, the horse had to face starvation and fend for himself. But not when he's in the cowboy's corral. There's food placed before him every day, fresh from the mill. There's water in his trough at all times, clean and pure. But not only did that horse receive the resources that he needed when he came into the possession of the cowboy, but while he was out on the plain, there were dangers. There were coyotes out there who was just waiting for that horse to slip or to trip and to fall and to injure a leg. And then a pack of coyotes, ravenous beings, would destroy that animal, but not while it's in the cowboy's care. There is nothing that can touch him. They used to hang people for stealing a horse. That's how great of a possession the horse was to the cowboy. Do I need to describe to you how this affects you and I? Oh, oftentimes we may feel as if God's being cruel, but in reality He's being demonstrating to us His grace and His goodness by bringing us to a place of submission whereby we will understand how important we are as His possession and how far He will go to bring us to the place where He needs us to be so that we will fulfill His purpose and understand that He has our greatest good always in mind. But unfortunately, sometimes he has to wrestle with us in order to teach us. But there is a second unusual method of spiritual development that is illustrated by the life of Jacob. Not only will we have to wrestle at times with an unexpected opponent, but we will have to also walk in some unaccustomed origins. Jacob had spent the majority of, life, of his life walking in his steps that were provided or were planned by Jacob. If anyone had ever marched to the beat of his own drum, it was Jacob. But in this instance, he is going to have to learn to walk in some origins that he is unaccustomed. And the first unaccustomed origin that Jacob is going to have to experience and walk in is unfortunately the origin of brokenness. Notice verse 25. Verse 24, we're told that Jacob wrestled with this man who actually is a pre-incarnate Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ. He wrestled with him till the breaking of the day. Then in verse 25, and when he, Jesus, saw that he, Jesus, prevailed not against him, Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh. That poses a question, doesn't it? If Jesus 
had power over Jacob for the duration of the battle. And he could have ended the battle at any moment with his, through his divine power. Why was it necessary to touch Jacob's thigh? Because most of the time we can't be blessed until first we have been broken. A.W. Tozer, a writer from the past, has said that no man or woman of God can be used greatly by God until they have first experienced a period of brokenness. I know that flies in the face of our modern pie-in-the-sky theology that we love to hear. That don't fit... I'm a, that don't fit in the margin of a Joel Osteen book. But it's reality. Psychologists tell us that when we as human beings are faced with travail, tragedy, anxiety, worry, or fear, we normally respond in one of three ways. Flight, fight, or fold. We run from the adversity we fight the adversity or we just give up and quit and surrender to it. Isn't it interesting that that's normally the way that we respond to God's activity in our lives as well? When God begins to chisel us like the construction worker chiseled the stone, we either run from Him, we argue with Him, or we just sit down and quit. But God breaks us in order to deal with each possible avenue of our reaction. In Jacob's life, he touched his hip in order to hobble Jacob so that Jacob could not flee. Remember that old Western movie? You remember those horses that had a tendency to run? In the evening times when those cowboys would come in from their long day on the range, they would tie those horses up in a picket line. And if a horse had a tendency to spook easily and was a runner, they would take its front hoof, raise it up, tie a rope around that hoof to the saddle horn or around the horse's back so that the horse was hobbled. It could not run if it was spooked. Jacob was a runner. He had run from everything all his life. He ran from Esau. He ran from Isaac. He ran from Laban. But you can't run from God. Sometimes God will break us just to show us we can't. But not only does He hobble us in order that we will not flee Him, but He humbles us in order to keep us from fighting Him. There's an instance after the touching of the hip of Jacob where Jacob has asked his name. The asking of Jacob's name is actually a confession. For the name in Hebrew tradition represents the character of the person bearing the name. The name carries with it the totality of who that being is. And in a wrestling match with the Lord Jesus Christ, Jacob is asked his name and Jacob must confess, I'm Jacob the deceiver. But he also must confess that he has the inability to do anything about who he is himself when he responds by saying, I'll hold on until you bless me. Jacob knows that he has not the ability to be anything other than Jacob without the help of the one who has a hold of him. And that's the, 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 the real definition of humility. When we recognize who he is and who we are, and we see the vast difference in between and realize that the only way we can ever become any closer to who He wants us to be is through the hands of divinity. Therefore, Jacob is humbled to keep him from fighting. He had fought everything else. But not this instance. God will hobble us to keep us from fleeing. God will humble us to keep us from fighting. And God at times will hurry us to keep us from sitting down. 
Did you notice that? The Lord seems to be in a hurry for this to be over, doesn't he? I know Jacob's in a hurry for this to be over. Jacob thought he was wrestling with Esau, so he was immediately scared to death. Then when he realizes that he's fighting with a divine assailant, his hip is touched, and now he's in agony and pain. He wants to be blessed so severely that he hangs on, recognizing in reality, recognizing and realizing that it is only his assailant that can bless him. And the Lord says several times, it's about to be the breaking of day. Carries with it the idea of urgency, doesn't it? We've got to get this over with before the sun rises. That's not Jacob's word, that's Jesus' word. We've got to get this over with before the sun rises. Why was Jesus in such a hurry? Because Esau's coming in the morning. River's going to be crossed in the morning. Jacob's got to face things he can't face as Jacob. He's got to face as Israel tomorrow. And if Jacob with a bad hip wants to quit, Jesus is not going to let him. Instead, he's going to hurry him along. Boy, I know this don't fit in some writer's margins, but it helps me. Brokenness. An origin that we are unfamiliar with, but an origin that is necessary for us to become conformed to the image of Christ. Thank God it doesn't stop there. For the origin of brokenness leads to the origin of of blessing. And Jacob is blessed. If you read this skeptically, if you read this casually, if you read this recklessly, you may ask the question, how on earth do we ever come to the realization that Jacob experienced a blessing? He has been scared nearly to death. He has had his hip touched to the point where he will bear an injury the rest of his life. He has wrestled with divinity and struggled through the night. What he has to face in the morrow does not seem in any way to be of encouragement. But we know he was blessed because the text tells us he was blessed. There was the blessing, first of all, of closeness. I know it's elementary. I know I'm somewhat shallow. I know I am not a scholar, nor am I a great theologian. But I just know this, that you can't get any closer to God when He's wrestling with you. You can't get any closer to someone than when you're in hand-to-hand combat with them. And it's the testimony of many that in the moments of brokenness when God seemed to be desperately distant, that He was immediately close But there's the second blessing that Jacob experienced. And that that is that his character was exchanged. He walks into this instance or he limps out of this instance, whichever way you like to look at it. No longer is Jacob, but is Israel. His name is changed. An action taken by the the divine one that he wrestles with. And the name Jacob meant deceiver, but the name Israel means prince of God. In this moment, in this instance of wrestling with the Lord Jesus Christ, the outcome for Jacob was a character change. He who had been a deceiver now becomes a prince. You realize you can't meet with Jesus long without in some way being transformed. Isaiah said, woe is me for I am undone, but before he left he was a prophet. Moses met a burning bush as a shepherd and left as a leader. Paul, a persecutor of the church, met Jesus on the Damascus road and went to Damascus not as a persecutor, but as a preacher of the gospel and a missionary. You can't come into face-to-face contact with God Almighty and leave the same as when you came in. 
And that's the great blessing of the presence of the Lord, that He is continually transforming and changing us into His image. But the blessing doesn't stop there. When we wrestle with God, there will be closeness. When we wrestle with God, it's for, so that He might change our character. But His consciousness was enhanced as well. He got a greater understanding of who God was. Some people look at this passage of Scripture as Jacob's conversion experience, Old Testament conversion experience. But actually, Jacob was converted at Bethel 20 years prior. He asked me, Greg, how do you know? Because it was there that he heard the voice of God. By faith, faith come by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. He heard the Word of God. He responded in an appropriate way. And there was a commitment made by God to Jacob there 20 years earlier at Bethel. And the most the most graphic piece of evidence that Jacob was converted at Bethel is because when he left, he promised to tithe. Well, you can't get saved people to tithe. Therefore, something happened to Jacob in Bethel, and that was his conversion experience. But now, 20 years later, he experiences God in a different way. Not at the top of a ladder, but face to face. And the God that he had heard about from Abraham and the God that he had heard about from Isaac and the God that he had seen through a vision, he has intimate personal contact with to the point that he says, I saw him face to face. If you get nothing else out of this sermon, do not miss this. If you're taking a note, write this one down and, and underlining it in red and erase the rest. The most important the most important, the most important thing that can happen in our lives and our greatest desire and priority should be to know our Father better. Paul said to the Philippians, I'll throw everything that the world deems as precious away just for the opportunity to know Him. Paul if anybody knew him, I thought you would have. Paul said, there's more to know. And I'll throw it all away to know him better. Most people think that the high watermark of the book of Job is found in the last chapter where we're told that Job was blessed in the second part of his life greater than he was in the first part of his life. But in reality, the high watermark of the book of Job is when Job, after wrestling with God and wrestling with Satan and wrestling with his friends and his family, comes to the reality that he could confess, my ears had heard of you, but now my eye has seen. And that should be the desire of our heart to know our Father better. What a blessing. But it'll take some unusual methods to get there. We may have to wrestle with an unexpected opponent, God. We may have to walk in some unaccustomed origins. Brokenness, but blessing. And we may have to withstand some uncomfortable outcomes. You realize that every decision that we take or we make, every word that we speak, every step that we take, and every action that we make, carries with it consequences. Sometimes God will deliver us from those consequences. Sometimes God will remove those consequences. But more often than not, He uses those consequences, whether positive or negative, to develop us as He is chiseling away what needs to be chiseled away for us to look like Jesus. I know this is not a, this is not an encouraging message, but Jacob discovered this, and you probably will too if you grow any closer to God than you are right now. There are some uncomfortable reunions that you're going to have to endure. Look at how this text concludes 
verses 31 and verse 32. Verse 31, we're told, he passed, as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose. How always does. And that's exactly what Jesus was preparing Jacob for. He had been broken. He had been blessed. He met God face to face. But he still had to meet Esau. Wasn't that how we got here in the first place? Isn't that the consequence that Jacob had prayed to avoid? But what Jacob discovers if you continue to read his biography is this. When he meets Jacob, Jacob falls on his neck, not as an adversary. But he kisses him and responds to him as a brother. You know what that tells me? God would not allow Jacob to avoid the encounter. But God had always already been at work in order that the encounter might accomplish what God wanted it to. And instead of finding an adversary, Jacob found a brother. He didn't want to go, but he did. And when he did, he found out that God was working in greater ways that he could not see. But there are also, not only, some reunions that we'll have to endure. may have to go to somebody this afternoon and apologize. may have to see someone you wish you could avoid. But there are also some unfortunate reminders that we'll have to carry. You know that most theologians and scholars and physicians conclude that this injury that Jacob experienced on that night at the hand of God had to be carried, the effects of it had to be carried for the remainder of his life. In other words, Jacob walked with a limp and experienced a certain amount of pain for the rest of his life. Can you imagine his grandkids coming up to him and saying, Jacob, why do you limp? Jacob saying, oh, the Lord blessed me. Those grandkids saying, it don't look like he blessed me. It don't look like he blessed To me, it don't look like he blessed me. It looks like he dang near killed you. <laughs> but what was broken became a blessing. And God didn't take it away. So that it would be a continual reminder to Jacob of past failures and past blessings. I know y'all don't care, but I have a scar on this hand. Age has caused it to fade. Wear has caused it to be diminished. But it's still visible. I can still remember how I got it. It was a real act of stupidity. But you know... This car reminds me of several things. First of all, I've been working with dangerous machinery and I have reached my hand close to the most dangerous point and I've got a glimpse of that scar and pulled my hand back. Avoided a danger by the reminder of the scar. Something else that scar always reminds me of. Boy, when I cut that hand, it was ugly. It was to the bone. It was broad, deep, and wide, and it was painful. But now all I have is a scar. It don't affect my usage of my hand. It don't hurt me any. Don't cause me any pain. It reminds me of the reality that God can heal any wound. And then it reminds me of one other thing. It's fading with age and with wear. But I won't wear it forever. 
You think Jacob walks with a limp now? Hey, sometimes God leaves stuff in our lives that we wish that he would erase in order that it might cause us to avoid future problems or mistakes. You don't think that Jacob in a moment when he was susceptible to reverting back to his old tactics of taking God's will in his own hand did not take a step in that direction and go, hmm, might ought to turn the other direction. Do you think when one of those four misses Jacobs gave Jacob a hard time about not taking the garbage out of the tent and Jacob wanted to respond in a moment of anger that right as Jacob raised his voice, there wasn't a pain in his hip and he said, Ugh. might ought to be quiet. That got me in trouble with Esau. Sometimes God leaves moments or reminders in our future in order that we might avoid painful moments similar to those of the past. Sometimes He leaves them just to remind us of how well He can cure an old wound. We may have to withstand some things that we'd love to avoid. Some reunions. Some reminders. Finally, <clears throat> there may be some realities that we forfeit when we refuse to allow God to do within us what He has to do within us in order to make us like Him and we wrestle with Him. Verse 32 is the most unusual verse to me found in this passage. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew that shrank. I've been told all of my life that every verse of Scripture has an application that applies to my personal life, and I had difficulty trying to figure out why this passage of Scripture is even in the Bible. Why was this prohibition instituted? Who instituted this prohibition? Did God institute it? It looks like if God would have instituted it, that it would have carried through to the Levitical law, but this is the only place in Scripture that it is mentioned. It looks to me like if Jacob had instituted it, that in some way we would have been told why Jacob instituted it. Did they no longer eat this piece of meat that was on the hip of animals because Jacob like me with cheesecake had had too much on this evening and just decided that he couldn't eat it anymore because it made him sick to think about it. And then there is the final question that I asked. Was it a good piece of meat? It seems to be. They ate it before it was prohibited, but in this instance it's prohibited. What does this passage of Scripture have to do with those of us living in the 21st century? Let me make a suggestion. I believe it's telling us this. When we've met God face to face and we've been touched in brokenness and experienced blessingness, blessedness, there are some engagements and some enjoyments that we just can't be involved in after that moment. And it may be not a heinous sin, but it may be something as simple as a piece of meat. There may be some websites. There may be some company we can't keep any longer. There just may be some things that we don't enjoy like we once did. And there may be some experiences that unfortunately we forfeit. I want to try to back into this last little portion. The book of Genesis here, the book of Malachi and the book of Romans remind us that even though Jacob was the second born, he was God's choice from the beginning. Now Jacob took matters into his own hands through deception, through extortion, and through human means, he attempted to accomplish the will of God according to Jacob's prescribed methods. Those methods that Jacob prescribed are outside of the holiness of God. God does not use deception in order to fulfill His will. God does not work through human ingenuity. He works through divine power. Therefore, since Jacob did God's will Jacob's way rather than waiting on God and doing God's will God's way, did Jacob miss something? 
And possibly did we. Did we miss seeing how God would have brought his will to pass rather than recognizing how Jacob did? I think Moses answered the question. You get to heaven before I do and you see Moses before I do. Ask him this question. Did you miss something by trying to take God's will into your own hands? You were told, Moses, to speak to the rock. But instead of listening to God, you did it your way. And you struck the rock. And you never saw the promised land. I believe when we get to the beam of seat of Christ and our efforts are rewarded or they become hay and stubble and are burned and consumed by fire. If there is any pain at all in heaven, it will be this. What might have been? What might have been if we just let God do his thing his way? What might have been if we stood out of the way? What might have been if the will of God became our desire and His accomplishment became His authority and His realm of working? I know we're running over. You shouldn't invite me to preach. I'm not going to drive an hour and a half in the snow to preach 20-minute devotion. But can I conclude with a word of personal testimony? September of this past year, I turned 55. Five years earlier, individuals discovered that I was going to turn 50. And everybody made a big deal of it. You would have thought by listening to some that it was reason for reward and you would have thought by others that it was a curse. You're turning 50! Oh, you're turning 50. You have to understand who Greg is. I just don't get carried away by birthdays. I just don't. I don't understand it. If you do, that's fine. It's up to you. I just cannot understand celebrating so greatly breathing for 365 days. Something I do involuntarily. Now, I I do treasure every moment that God gives me. I do thank him on every birthday that I have had another one. But it's just no reason for reward for Greg. But with that said, I didn't think it would bother me, but five years ago when I turned 50, I woke up on that morning, was getting ready to go to work, and I was shaving in front of the mirror. Now, me and God, we have some... We've had some very interesting times in my prayer closet, but we also have some pretty in-depth conversations while I'm shaving in the front of the mirror in the morning. And I was shaving in front of the mirror, and for some reason that started to bother me. Oh, I'm turning 50, I'm turning 50. Well, some people say it's a curse, some people say it's a blessing. I just don't care, and I was starting to become frustrated with myself. So as I do sometimes, because it is therapy, I took a sheet of paper, I laid it out, and I wrote some things down, and I wrote this. When I was 25, I thought I could conquer the world. When I was 35, I thought given the opportunity and enough time, I could fix the world. When I was 45, I began to ask the question, what in the world is going on in the world? Today I turned 50, and I've just decided to let God be God. Walked out. On my way to work, threw that piece of paper in the trash can, and that day, as I went through the day on my 50th birthday, little things would occur that may hinder me or may addle me or may anger me, and I just said, I don't let God be God. Day two, I didn't think anything of it. I'd forgotten that I'd even written that down. Then day three, day three is resurrection day. Brother, day three is when things happen. Isn't that what we find in Scripture? Can I tell you what happened? I had one of those days. You know what one of those days is? One of those days is so bad that you must inflect and drag out the word those because it is so horrible. It's one of those days when everything that can go wrong will does because it can. 
I became frustrated, irritated, and agitated, and I didn't remember a thing in the world about what I'd written on that sheet of paper. When I got home that evening, I decided I needed to mow grass. Grass didn't need to be mowed, but you have to understand, just like in front of the mirror, shaving, sometimes God and I have some deep theological conversations about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness while I'm mowing grass. Well, I was using a lawnmower that had cranked on the first time for five years, and it wouldn't crank. Finally, when I got it cranked, I could not make any progress. I was having to stop, move something, pick something up, move it out of the way. I became more and more frustrated. I wasn't talking to God. I promise you. <laughs> and then without thinking, I pushed that push lawnmower right up on a metal grade stake. You know what happens when that occurs. It stopped it cold. Motor stopped. Blade destroyed. I'm trying to crank it, crank it, crank it, and it will not crank again. I can actually remember saying this. I looked toward heaven, and not in disrespect, but in a literal word of prayer, I said, Lord, what's going on? And not in an audible voice, but in a still small voice that spoke to my heart, he responded by saying, I thought you were ready to let God be God. And then, maybe it's because I'm somewhat sarcastic. He deals with me based upon who I am. But he didn't let it in there. He said, need I remind you that I'm a lot better at it than you are. You know what Jacob's problem was? He wrestled with God because he had never come to the place where he was willing to let God be God. You know what my problem was? For 42 years of Christian living, I was glad to be saved, but I was hesitant in letting God be God. I would venture to say the majority of individuals sitting in the average Baptist church on this morning have never come to the place where they're willing just to let God be God. You know why? Because we give all of the blame for our problems in the wrong direction. The world, the pandemic, politics, global circumstances is not the problem in today's church. Because my Lord said, I have overcome the world. And he does not ask. He assigned himself the position of the head of the church. Therefore, if there's not anything wrong with the head, which there's not, and our head has overcome the circumstances. That only leaves one area for there to be harm. And that is the church. The greatest problem in our churches, the greatest problem in our families, the greatest problem in our Christian lives, the greatest problem in our denomination is that we refuse to surrender to the head. And if you can't look around and tell we're wrestling with him, then you just don't know him that well. The invitation this morning is just let God be God. Just let the head be the head. I promise you it's freeing. It's overwhelming. It's overcoming.
It's a blessing instead of a curse for individuals who have confused verses, curses and blessings. You know, we have done that. We've confused what is a curse and what is a blessing. Can I define it real quickly? Anything that brings you closer to Jesus, regardless of how painful or regardless of how out of the ordinary it may be, is a blessing. And anything, regardless of how it is evaluated by everyone else, that takes you away from Jesus is a curse. So this morning, are you willing to let God be God?